Well, I think we will get started. Um, people will be coming into Zoom as we begin, and people are coming into the room still. And so welcome to all of you here in the room and those of you who are coming in via Zoom. So I'm Marie Harvey, Associate Dean for Research in the College of Excuse me, no, the College of Health. <laughs> what is our name? Are, we, we're, sh we're not clear about our identities lately. We are what, sure what our school is, but you're clear what your school is, right? <laughs> you're getting clear. We're, we're naming our na our schools, college, and we, anyway, we aren't all together what our identity is. We're here to talk about health for sure. Health. That one we can take to, we can take to, well, that one to the bank. Anyway. Um, I'm delighted you're here for our seminar today, um, and I think what I'll do is to turn it over to Stephanie so we can get started listening to our speaker. So I'm pleased to introduce Stephanie Grutzmacher. Stephanie is an associate professor in both global health and in nutrition. I got those, those are real. I got those straight. <laughs> so anyway, and she will introduce our speaker. So Stephanie, thank you very much. She'll also moderate the session. That may be all digress. So sorry. Thank you, Marie. Um, so our speaker today is Kristen Yaris. She comes to us from the University of Oregon. Um, she is an engaged anthropologist with a professional background in public health and community mental health, whose research and teaching lies in two primary areas, transnational migration and global mental health. At University of Oregon, um, where she's had a position since 2012, she's worked with students and faculty to launch the University of Oregon Global Health Initiative, excuse me, in, um, which involves the Global Health Minor and the Center for Global Health. She's also affiliate faculty with the Center of Global Health and the Department of Anthropology, the Disability Studies Program, and the Center for the Study of Women in Society. Um, she has many ways of engaging both in the campus community and the uh, broader community, and we'll hear about some of that work today. Um, so please join me in welcoming her to the Friday seminar. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Make sure that I'm audible because I know how important that is, especially to all of us who are here today remotely. And thanks to everyone for showing up on this Friday afternoon. Thank you in particular to Marie Harvey for the invitation to be with you today. And the connection that I have to Marie came through Jocelyn Warren at Lane County Public Health. And you'll hear a little bit about my connection and my work with Lane County Public Health in this talk. Um, so I'm, in addition to being in the Department of Global Studies and affiliated with a global health program at the University of Oregon, my training is as a medical anthropologist, and I'm also a proud alumna of the UCLA School of Public Health, where I got my master's in public health and community health sciences in 2004, and also an MA in Latin American studies. And part of what I'm going to do in this talk, in this time with you this afternoon, is describe my local engagements with public health that emerged out of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly in 2020 to 2022. And I was really drawn into this local community health work, I think, by my formation um, as an MPH student and as someone committed to community health justice, community health equity. So as a medical anthropologist, I've long been influenced by the work of the late Paul Farmer, may he rest in power, as we say, and was in fact teaching two of his books, an introduction to global health textbook, which is on the top of this slide, which some of you may also use in your classrooms and his powerful 2006 Pathologies of Power, which is truly an indictment of power inequality and the production of poverty through structural, political, economic relationships in um, global health. So I was teaching these two books in winter term of 2020 to my introduction to global health class at the University of Oregon, the required class for the global health minor, when, of course, COVID hits the world. And I was trying to make sense, probably like many of you in your classes, if you were teaching that winter term, I was trying to make as best sense of the emergent conditions of the global public health emergency in real time, um, both the epidemiology of disease spread across borders and the unfortunately all too politicized response 
to COVID-19 um, in the U.S. and around the world. So as I tried to shift my attention to COVID and its impact for all of us, um, I began to turn my attention locally. And by locally, I mean very locally, to my communities in Eugene Springfield. And I connected with the Lane County Public Health Department because for as is said on this slide, essentially all public health in the U.S. is local and there is no public health without a public sector. Also, fortunately for me, having been a professor in global health for about 10 years at that time at the University of Oregon, I used my student connections. I had a handful of students, former global health students, working at Lane County Public Health. And the collaborations that I'll talk to you about today really grew out of the work that I connected with with my students who were on the inside, as it were. So the quotes from Farmer that I have on this slide are really guideposts for me in my academic and professional career and in some ways also will guide the arguments I seek to put forward in this presentation, namely how economic and social forces shaped the disparate impact of COVID-19, um, both around the world and locally, and the importance of engaging with local public health or community health efforts to respond, not just to public health emergencies, but to what we talk about, building back better from the lessons from the pandemic for robust community health engagements for health equity moving forward. So in this presentation, I'm going to focus on three moments of engagement with health inequities and responses to them locally. First, a rapid community survey of COVID experiences among Latinx community members in Lane County. Second, my experiences working as a volunteer with the Oregon Worker Relief Fund from 2020 to 2022, and I'll describe a little bit more about that project. And third, how I moved those pandemic experiences forward into a collaborative um, engagement with Lane County Public Health, particularly through the development of LCPH's new Community Partnerships Program, a program that seeks to build on the partnerships forged during the COVID pandemic to institutionalize community health equity work moving forward. So as we know, COVID exposed structural inequities in the U.S. and around the world. These inequities uh, predated the pandemic, but were drawn forward in stark relief by COVID-19. In the U.S., we saw these inequities reveal um, the effects and legacies of structural racism and historical marginalization of communities of color, um, immigrant communities. We also saw inequities by occupation and geography and socioeconomic status. Importantly, also at the outset of the pandemic, and some of you may have noticed this, in 2020, across most of the summer of 2020, we really didn't have good data on particularly racial and ethnic disparities in COVID in the U.S. And in part, those efforts have been um, remediated. But early on, it was hard to figure out or track in real time, especially comparatively across jurisdictions or states, how different communities of color in the U.S. were being impacted. We also, of course, saw fragmented and unequal access to testing, immunizations, and medical care and treatment. And then the pandemic revealed for all of us the lack of federally protected paid sick leave, caregiving leave, our limited social safety net, and then particular particular uh, vulnerabilities experienced by undocumented people, their inability to access state unemployment insurance benefits, early inabilities to access CARES Act benefits as they were written out of the first initial um, CARES Act. Um, and so in this talk, I'm going to respond um, going to explore a little bit about local responses to those inequities and to those gaps. But what I want to mention here is that, of course, we in public health and critical medical anthropology knew about these social and systemic pathologies that were shaping upstream the downstream drivers of health inequities long before the pandemic. And that's why I put this quote from Paula Braveman and her colleague on this slide. This was an article that I was teaching. It was published in 2011. So for you know more than a decade, we've had an SDOH framework, social determinants of health framework in public health that has been motivating our work. But COVID comes along and draws forward the importance of this work to, us, to address so, social and structural drivers of downstream health inequalities. So for Latin communities in the US in particular, these inequities looked like, and here I'm talking about what I've come to think of as the pre-vaccine year, the year of 2020. Latinx uh, groups across the U.S. experienced two to four times higher rates of COVID infection, disproportionately high mortality rates, up to one and a half times higher 
than their white counterparts nationwide. And in our state, Oregon, we saw similar disparities. Latinx folks bore about three times the proportion of infections in uh, compared to their proportion in the population across the state. And this was the summer months from June to September 2020. And the same pattern figured locally in Lane County, where I was working. While Latinx folks are about 12% of the roughly 350,000 population in Lane County, there were almost a quarter of new COVID infections. And one pause here on collection of race and ethnicity data. I'm sure some of you were looking to the same data visualization online sources that I was in this time to try to track some of these impacts. Fortunately, I had the Johns Hopkins COVID tracker, the COVID-19 tracking project and the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation making this data available to us. It wasn't always comparable across states. And I'm really interested if anyone wants to speak about this in our conversation after the talk in Oregon's real D efforts to kind of collect better, more robust data, not just on race and ethnicity, but ability status and lessons learned from the pandemic about the importance of making visible health inequities and collecting data to do so. So how do we explain these disparate impacts of COVID for Latinx communities and other marginalized communities and uh, in Oregon and the US and globally? In other words, what are our explanatory models for health inequity? So here again, I'll draw on Farmer's work in Infections and Inequalities, another of his favorite books of mine, where he talks about, um, to anthropologists in particular, the need to resist facile or immodest claims of causality. And when he's speaking to medical anthropologists, what he's telling us is to look beyond cultural beliefs as explanations of downstream health inequities. For Farmer, of course, the work is really about poverty as a fundamental driver of ill health and disease. But also we have competing, what we might think of as existing on a kind of spectrum, competing explanations for health inequities from cultural, more cultural explanations that tend to attribute downstream health outcomes to individual level factors, beliefs, behaviors, or sometimes at a family or community level. So during the pandemic, early on, we heard a lot of talk about pre-existing conditions. We heard talk about overcrowded housing. And to the extent that um, folks might have attributed overcrowded housing to upstream lack of affordable housing or residential segregation patterns, we might think of overcrowded housing as a more structural explanation, but it tends to be, and if you look back in media coverage from 2020, when overcrowded housing was talking up, was being talked about, particularly for immigrant communities, it was talked about as a cultural feature, like people like to live in crowded conditions because they prefer intergenerational family uh, living arrangements, which may have some truth to it. But what I'm going to ask us to do in this presentation is think about the relative way or uh, um, interpretive value of these different types of explanations from cultural to structural. And of course, as we think about structural explanations for health inequalities, we're thinking about explanations that lie in political systems and in economic inequities in social policies and the ways in which those disparately impact histor historically marginalized communities. And this approach aligns with other medical anthropologists' work in structural competency. So I've been inspired by the work of Helena Hansen and Jonathan Metzl and often teach in my classes this notion of structural competency rather than, or in addition to thinking about the importance of cultural competency for healthcare providers, Hansen and Metzl talk about structural compet competency is directing healthcare systems, and they're particularly talking about medical systems, but we could also extend their argument to public health systems. Healthcare systems need to intervene at the level of social structures, institutions, and policies that must be altered to improve population health and promote health equity. So again, how we interpret health inequities is important because it shapes how we respond through public health policies, programs, and local interventions. And during the pandemic's early phase and into the present, I think individual cultural level explanations have abounded and I think sometimes have been easier to fall into. And so it's important to continue to remind ourselves of the social, economic, and policy level factors that shaped COVID inequalities and continue to shape health inequity in the present. So this was um, the antecedent, the kind of way I was entering my work with local public health in the late winter and early spring of 2020, I joined forces with, with Lane County Public Health. As I said, I used my moles on the inside, my former students, 
And they invited me to join. Um, we had a Latinx advisory board. It, w- it was a team and we met on teams every week to talk about how we could inform the public health rollout of prevention strategies during this early phase, again, 2020 phase of the pandemic. So I'm talking about pre-vaccination phase pretty much for most of my remarks today. And of course, our main modes of prevention at that time were testing, contact tracing, and um, case monitoring. So Lane County Public Health, like many local health departments and the Oregon Health Authority, were putting these mass testing events together. And maybe some of you got a test there, and maybe some of you volunteered at one of these, and they looked like the top image on the slide. They were often drive-through testing events. People would stay in their automobiles, roll down their window, and someone in PPE would give them maybe a nasal swab, and off they would go. In Lane County, these events were held at the Lane County Fairgrounds, um, and often there was a collaboration with the National Guard who would show up in uniforms, which um, had an intimidation factor for some of our, particularly our Latinx immigrant communities who came from countries where people in armed uniforms weren't necessarily trying to help them. Um, And also we did some mass testing events and later vaccine events at the Ducks Stadium. And I thought you would all go boo or hiss when I said that. (laughs) But the thing about these mass events is they didn't reach everyone. Same with the mass immunization events in 2021. And so for Lane County Public Health, they were quickly realizing the folks who weren't showing up at these events were maybe the obvious ones, rural residents, people living in more remote parts of the county, people without their own private cars, and non-English speakers, Spanish speakers, indigenous language speakers, and immigrant communities. So quickly, a pivot was made away from these mass testing events towards more community-focused events. And in making these pivots, um, Lane County Public Health drew upon its staff on the inside who were often bilingual and bicultural and who knew Lane County's immigrant communities and Latinx and Spanish-speaking and mom-speaking communities in the south part of the county. So those personal connections were really important. And then they drew and built upon existing uh, relationships with community-based organizations or CDOs, local nonprofit service providers often who worked with families in these communities, kids in their schools, et cetera. So what these community testing events looked like, they were held often at libraries or schools, school parking lots, trying to think of other places where we had them. And they looked really different from the mass testing events. People walked up, Often the staff on site were, the nurses were in full PPE, the ones doing the nasal swabs, but they had greeters in street clothes, obviously with face masks, but um, it was a much more welcoming environment. The CDO partners um, that helped put these testing events on, some of you may have also volunteered at them like I did, would bring social and health services to the event. So there'd be a table of services about child care support or food security support, or sometimes food boxes for the families coming to get testing. So they looked really different and they lowered the barriers to entry. And as an example, I'll never forget that I went to one of these mass testing events that was supposed to be for Spanish speaking community members. And there was public health nurses there in their full PPE for four hours. And they had called on us Spanish speaking volunteers to show up. And in that four hour event, we had like three people get tested. I mean, it was a huge race of resources, to be honest. It didn't reach its intended community. And then the next weekend, we had an event in South Lane County at Cottage Grove at a school, and we had hundreds of people lined up. And you can see that in the image here. Um, In the same four-hour period, we were able to offer many more tests. So it really shifted how the delivery of this much-needed prevention, that is COVID testing, was organized. But at these testing events, um, which were reaching their intended communities, it became also clear to some of us Um, including myself and my colleagues at Lane County Public Health, that they presented a really good opportunity to start asking questions of Spanish-speaking community members about, like, where are you getting your information about COVID? Um, What do you think about COVID? What do you think about tests? Um, How is COVID COVID impacting you and your family and your children? So what we did is, starting in June of 2020, we launched this um, sort of rapid epidemiological assessment um, that we conducted at community testing events that were intended to reach Spanish and indigenous um, Latin name members of our Lane County community. Our overarching question was really, it's hard to imagine at this time because much has since been published, but in May, June, 2020, when we were bringing this together, we knew very little, if anything, about how Latinx immigrants in the US were experiencing COVID, what they thought about it, where they were getting their information. 
So literally we had a very pragmatic question. This was a very applied project. It was just for the county health department to better understand this part of its service community. I did get IRB approval for this study, and I just want to say I was so appreciative of the University of Oregon IRB for working with me because we ramped this up really, really quickly. And of course, we were collecting data in the field in this pre-vaccine period when we were concerned about disease spread. So it meant for me as an anthropologist, I wasn't going to be doing hour-long sit-down interviews with people in their homes. I was going to be doing these interviews in hopefully under five minutes because we were really concerned about exposure at kind of an arm's distance from people. We might have violated that one or two times. And we use this great program called EpiClint. Have any of you ever used it? Super cool, and it's free. So I encourage you to check it out. That's a look at what it looks like on my phone. Um, and what this enabled us to do was myself and my wonderful student, Carolina Lira Sanchez Arredondo, who is my mole inside the public health department, we were the data collectors in the field. So we mounted our little questionnaire and there was about 10 to 15 questions, very basic, like where are you getting your information about COVID? What's the impacts of COVID on yourself and your family, et cetera. And we were able to collect that data on our phone and in real time, I had two graduate students on the back end. Of course, we were all closed down, right? And working remotely. So they were in their living rooms or bedrooms or at home safely um, analyzing the data. So what this enabled me to do is after every testing event, I produced a report for the health department. Like this is what we're finding. The other thing I wanna mention here is we collected no demographic data. We didn't ask sex gender. We obviously didn't ask immigration status. We didn't ask age or anything. And there are several reasons for this and I'm happy to talk about this more in bulk, why we did it and the limitations of this. But um, from a public health perspective, of course, it limits our ability to do like fancy statistical modeling and descriptive statistics is pretty much all we have. But what our main concern was, was not asking anything that would push people away from these events or word would get out that there are these surveyors and they're gonna ask you private questions. So we kept all of that out and we simply just asked people about their experiences of COVID. It also became very clear to our friends and colleagues at the public health department that on every single flyer and announcing every testing event and later the vaccination events in 2020, they had to put in bold print. You will not be asked about your immigration status and you will not be asked about your insurance status because those were real barriers for people inhibiting them from coming and showing up at these public health events. So that's a little bit about our survey and EpiCollect. It's a fun little app and it's free. Okay, so a little bit about our findings from this survey. Again, as I mentioned, our main interest was just describing the community's experience of COVID and channeling that information back to Lane County Public Health so that they could tailor both uh, prevention messages and health outreach programs moving forward. Um, so we asked folks, where are you getting your information about coronavirus? And you'll see here on this slide, hopefully, 20 about there's about 70 respondents, but they could select more than one response. So the N isn't exactly 70 here. The N is much higher. But most people are actually getting their information about COVID. Again, this data is June to October 2020, all pre-vaccine phase, early phase of the pandemic. Most people are getting their information on our one Spanish language radio station, La Que Buena 97.7, La Misora. So that's where they were getting their information about COVID. And yet Lane County Public Health didn't have any regular PSAs or communication on the local Spanish language radio. And unfortunately, still to this day, despite my prodding, oh no, this is being recorded. I mean, that's in a good way. But we need to use local language radio stations as local public health, because while social media is important and you'll see most people got their information from Facebook, and I'll talk about that in a minute, radio still matters for folks. Um, and I would argue that it's an important mode of local health departments and even state health departments getting their messages out, not just in public health emergencies, but beyond. Um, so I'll come back to Facebook in a minute because it was the number one source of information. Um, but also I wanna draw our attention to the fact that only about 5% of folks were getting their information from what we might call official channels, the CDC, the OHA, or Lay County Public Health, which had um, a website that they were updating. So people were turning to more informal channels of communication and Facebook was the number one. But the other one I wanna mention that doesn't show up here because it's in the other category is a number of parents said they were getting their information from their children's schools. And that became really important, especially as we moved into the vaccine rollout phase. Um, Lane County Public Health was able to partner with Head Starts and our three main local school districts 
to get information out about the vaccine and then later about pediatric vaccine availability. So it's for, I think, for local public health to really partner with schools and and also uh, Head Starts is really important because those are folks that people trust, right, in their community, their school teachers. So back to Facebook, about actually, here it says 27%, but if you continue the survey to 2021, as we did, we ultimately have like five phases of it. The number or proportion of people getting their information about COVID on Facebook continue to rise. And at one point it was like 50% would tell us that. So as we move them, the various phases of the survey. And this is of course disconcerting because what they meant by Facebook wasn't like OHA's Facebook live videos or the CDC's Facebook channel. It was just posts and read posts and messages that were getting into their feed or their scroll or whatever. It wasn't official public health information. So Facebook, um, as we know, subsequently Facebook and other social media companies came under criticism, particularly in 2020 and beyond, 2021 and beyond for spreading misinformation about um, the dangers of COVID vaccines and, you know, still remains, I think, a big and important area for those of us interested in public health communication, the spread of inaccurate information that goes unregulated online on some of these sites. And in fact, the WHO called this a parallel pandemic of misinformation or an infodemic. And now there's this whole WHO effort against misinformation, not just about immunizations, but beyond. And I think this is a really interesting area for like current students in global health to think about. But the thing I wanna say about Facebook as a source of COVID information for Lane County Latinx or Spanish speaking residents is it's not unique to them, right? Like millions of people in the US and around the world, billions are getting their information about public health, quote unquote, um, COVID-19 shots and tests from Facebook. So this source of misinformation is much bigger than immigrant communities or Spanish speaking communities. But there are ways in which we might think about misinformation that spread through Facebook as a social risk factor unique to Latinx communities. Um, and here I wanna draw our attention to the fact that this is the summer of 2020 in which um, the U.S. probably can be described as a very hostile um, political and discursive climate to immigrants. ICE raids and deportations are running rampant. Um, we've just lived through the period of a public charge rule that had a chilling effect on immigrants' use of health and other social services. Community members knew people who have been the ex had experienced workplace raids, and this information is also spreading online. So one of the um, beliefs that people had that was spreading on Facebook was that if you go to a COVID testing event or later a vaccine event, your information is going to be registered with the government. You got a government service, a COVID test or a shot, and that might come up against you when you seek to uh, adjust your status or apply for a green card or legal permanent residency status. And that has a real chilling effect on your willingness to come forward at a public health testing event. And while my colleagues at local public health did everything they could to tell folks like, no, we're not collecting information on your immigration status, this chilling effect still persisted. So here I just wanna pause and draw our attention to how do we interpret like misinformation that spreads on Facebook and other social media sites during the COVID-19 pandemic? Is this a cultural, you know, risk factor, or is this a more structural factor? And I think we could make arguments in either case, but as I heard increasing stories as I was surveying people at testing events about um, COVID impacting their spouse or COVID impacting someone in their family and then not wanting to go to the hospital because they don't want to use services because last year they applied for their green card. Um, it started to be clear to me that some of this like misinformation was actually grounded in real political fears. And then unfortunately by 2021 in Lane County at least, and I'm not sure if this happened in Lynn Benton, a lot of our testing events became the sites of um, anti-vaccination and white supremacist hostility. So we had um, testing events and later immunization events where people would drive. It always is a white Ram pickup. I'm not sure why and no offense if that's your vehicle, but you know, flying big American flags or don't tread on me flags in the background. And literally I was at an event I'm in a rural part of our county where they literally circled the wagons and intimidated the nurses so much that before the community had even showed up that day, we just called it, right? So this fear, this hostile political climate, right? Like showing up at a testing event or fears of being tested, which I'll talk about in a minute, 
is also founded in unfortunate political um, realities or what we might call structural barriers. So I'm happy to come back to, you know, Facebook and misinformation. I think I'm going to skip this slide for the sake of time, but I just will mention that as I've been talking about a little bit, one thing we did was feedback in real time to the health department, what we were finding about how people were learning about the testing events, and where they are getting their information about COVID. And then we made recommendations to the health department. So some of those are, you know, listed on this slide and I've, and I've mentioned them, I've mentioned them already. So returning to structural barriers to prevention and here we're really thinking about testing because that's our main mode of prevention in this phase one, this 2020 phase of the pandemic. There are other barriers that our survey respondents mentioned including a lack of money. So it was an idea that testing might not be free, even if everywhere on our promotional flyers and infographics, we said, you know, people still thought they might have to pay for it. Lack of health insurance was also listed as a barrier, even if, again, we said on our flyers, like you don't need insurance to show up. And then people talked about lack of access to tests. And then other folks did mention the hostile political climate as a reason not to get tested. So of our 70 or so respondents um, in that phase one period of the survey, about 60% were uninsured and about 40% had OHP. And one thing we took away from this was that OHP was a really important channel for information about COVID, about the importance of testing, and then later for vaccine outreach, because so many Spanish-speaking members of our community had OHP. Um, I already mentioned the, the public charge rule. So here I'll just mention a little bit about job loss. Um, so as I mentioned, we did this survey over five phases that continued into 2022 spring, and we were asking questions then about pediatric vaccines and parents' views of um, vaccines for their kids. At the time of um, this period of time, summer of 2020 into October, about 47% of those who were employed when we were asking them these questions said that they were worried about getting COVID at their place of employment. And that number continued to grow over time as we did this survey moving into 2021. So across Oregon in 2020, workplace outbreaks were ravaging the state. And I don't know if you remember this, but a lot of them received you know, news coverage. In our part of Southland County, we had fish processing plants on the coast and a big outbreak there where a lot of mom speaking folks from Guatemala worked. And those you know, that spreads in the community, right? And then we had outbreaks at agricultural sites, at forestry plants, at timber mills, and those outbreaks had real impacts on people's lives. So to illustrate, I'll share two examples. The, these are folks that I encountered at testing events, and as I'm doing the survey, I asked them a little bit more about their stories. So one is a male mill worker who'd been exposed at his workplace due to an outbreak of a, a dozen or more cons confirmed positive cases. The employer sent mill worker, timber company, sent everyone home for two weeks and didn't provide free testing or sick pay. Again, 2020. That, so they were sent into quarantine. The man had come to the county free testing event because he feared he'd been exposed at work. And he didn't want to return to work if he had a positive test. But he also feared that further income loss would set him back in his already behind rent and utility payments. And he felt little recourse or remedy he was unaware of any sick leave or other benefits he might have been eligible for. And he did tell me that he was undocumented and was reluctant to file any complaints against his employer for lost wages for fear of retaliation. Second, I'll describe a woman who I call Elmira. And she was in her 50s when I met her at a testing event, a different event in August 2020. And she was a domestica or a caregiver who'd worked for the same employer, an elderly woman who lived alone for many years, and this woman paid her out of pocket. Elmira was also undocumented. Elmira was required by her um, elderly employer to prove that she was negative with COVID um, because there had been a local highly publicized outbreak at our like Latino market in Eugene, and the employer got really scared that perhaps Elmira had shopped there and would bring COVID home, which maybe was a well-founded fear on the part of her um, health vulnerable employer, but what this resulted in for Elmira was a three-week hunt for a test. She was so grateful to have this local testing event. She hadn't heard about other opportunities to get tested. So she, she lost about three weeks of wages and then some because then she had to wait for her negative test result, which her employer required her to bring back to resume her work again. 
So these employment dynamics and power imbalances at work, for particularly for undocumented folks, further reveal some of the structural barriers to testing during this period that were experienced by members of Latinx communities. So that brings me to this finding from our survey about fear of the test. So one thing that we asked, again, in an effort to inform Lane County Public Health about how to better reach immigrant Spanish-speaking communities, was how do you think the people in your community or why do you think the people in your community are reluctant to get tested? What are some of the reasons? And we asked this question on purpose, asking folks about their general community, not their own personal um, fears about testing. And what we heard was that over 40% of people said, the reason for not getting tested is fear of the test. There are other things there that I mentioned on the prior slide. Again, happy to come back to in the Q&A if you'd like. But I wanna delve into this fear of the test response just for a moment, because I think it illustrates some of these competing claims of causality to use farmer's term or different cultural or structural explanations for testing reluctance that we might advance. So we can think about fear of the test, perhaps in a more cultural individual way or like health belief model type of a way. People were concerned about discomfort associated with the nasal swab. And volunteering at these events, I can tell you that was real. Some people, we kind of had to really explain it to them. They took maybe 15 minutes to feel comfortable. They had to watch a lot of other people have the nasal swab and kind of move through the line before they felt comfortable doing so, which is another reason that these community testing events were so important because they allowed that kind of time to happen. But in addition, there were concerns that the modality of the nasal swab itself might spread infection. So we might think about that as like misinformation, or we might think about that as maybe like suspicion of government that might be kind of a political or structural fear. So I think it's interesting to think about the multiple interpretations we might forward for this fear of the test. And I do think some of them fall in the realm of like health beliefs or cultural beliefs or ideas. But I also want to draw our attention to the ways we could interpret fear of the test from a more structural point of view. So thinking about the examples that I just gave you about people who feared positive test results because they wouldn't be able to go back to work and that meant lost income on which their families or children depended or inability to pay rent and they were already behind or lights are getting turned off and they're already behind on their utility bills. I think we can think about fear of the test as indexing not just fear of the modality, in this case we're using mainly the nasal swab, but fear of a result that was positive. And the social, economic, and familiar, familial implications that that would have for their lives. So I'm happy to come back to this, but actually I hadn't looked at this data for like a year because I tried to get an article published on this and it never happened. Um, and I was looking at it um, before I prepared this talk and I was like, this is such an interesting thing. And so really grateful for the opportunity to talk to you all about this. And I welcome your thoughts. And now I think I have to teach this because... You know, we can learn a lot from this, I think, um, and I love to hear your thoughts. So now I'd like to just move forward briefly to talk about a little bit about where I went with this, thinking about some of these social and economic impacts on undocumented immigrant communities in Oregon. And I'll just talk about this here relatively briefly. One thing that I got myself involved with as a volunteer from 2020 to 2021 was the Oregon Worker Relief Fund. Um, have any of you heard of this? Great, so it will be interesting. And if you're falling asleep, there's coffee in the back. This should be more interesting, hopefully. So to respond to the economic impacts we saw through our community survey, I connected with the Oregon Work Relief Fund. Now this was a public-private partnership that came about through our now defunct, unfortunately, CAUSA, Statewide Immigrant Rights Advocacy Umbrella Organization, Innovation Law Lab, and other immigrant rights and justice organizations in our state and then got the support of the Oregon legislature and later Kate Brown. So ultimately the fund was capitalized at more than $10 million, received a lot of private donations, including by the McKinsey River Gathering early on. What did the fund do? It sought to fill the gaps left by undocumented workers' exclusion from state unemployment insurance, which other out of work workers were able to claim right during the pandemic, and also um, the exclusions from the CARES Act. And it did this by rolling out this fund through local community-based organizations. So it was like an online platform that people would get navigated into through local community-based organizations and volunteer navigators like myself. So my role was to talk to people over Google Voice, have a phone call with them, 
go through the application with them. Usually it was in Spanish, answer the questions. And then someone in the back end, probably in Portland at Law Lab or something, determined their eligibility for assistance. Assistance eligibility was predicated on negative impact for economic impact to yourself or your family from the pandemic. So it was showing job loss um, or wage loss or income loss due to either you know economic closure or COVID infection and um, isolation or quarantine periods. And people who were deemed eligible were given a one-time payment of up to, on average, it was $1,500, but up to about $1,800. Um, cash. It was like a Visa credit card, or I think they used PayPal to make the transfer if people wanted it. So I think this is a really significant um, program. And for me, it was really exciting to get involved with it. It was not the only excluded worker fund that came online in the U.S. during the pandemic. There were others in New York and in Colorado, and I had some colleagues in Colorado involved with the excluded worker fund. I'll talk about that in a moment. In one year, the Worker Relief Fund dispersed more than $60 million to 37,000 people in Oregon's immigrant communities. It's no longer in existence, the Oregon Worker Relief Fund, but the model it provided is now being used um, by advocates involved with the Universal Representation Program, which is also an effort of Innovation Law Lab that's been funded by the state legislature. So I'm happy to talk to you more about this. I think this is one example that makes me really proud to be in Oregon, an example of the way our state is often taking the lead, whether it's an OHP expansion, emergency Medicaid expansion, or reproductive health access, um, in, including undocumented immigrants. They often say it's California first, but it's Oregon first, actually. I've written to editors about that because they're like, oh, um, Medicaid expansion first happened in California. I'm like, no, it was Oregon. I did. I wrote the editor. She said, yeah, but you're a smaller state. And I'm like, <laughs> so pictured on this slide are the Innovation Law Lab's annual report of the first year of the Oregon Worker Relief Fund. If you're interested in this in all, at all, I encourage you to take a look at it. It's online. It's called Narrowing the Gap. And also, as I said, I wrote with my colleagues, Sarah Horton and Whitney Duncan, two applied anthropologists working in Colorado with an excluded worker fund, a little piece for SFA News about this, um, because I wasn't doing research as a volunteer navigator. I was just doing it because I was in shutdown myself and had heard these stories of social and economic hardship and wanted to find a way to get involved. Also, I should say that the local CBO that I partnered with, which is Centro Latinoamericano, which is now called the Community Hub, um, I also had students working there. So it really benefits me to have students in all good places to hook me up with ways to get involved, former students. So I'll just share uh, one story from my time navigating through the Oregon Worker Relief Fund. I'll talk about Elisa, who was also in her mid-50s and also undocumented, and she worked for an agricultural subcontractor, but on a large industrial blueberry farm in Marion County. Um, and several coworkers on her crew fell ill and tested positive for COVID, and her contractor said they had to stay home for 14 days before coming back to work. This was September 2020. Elisa did not receive sick pay during this time, and so she applied to the fund for assistance to help cover food and rent payments for herself and her two school-age uh, children. Prompted by the fund application system, I asked Elisa during our interview for navigation if she'd sought healthcare or a COVID test, and she said no, she didn't know where to get either one. Um, so some communities still weren't being reached um, by testing or COVID um, prevention services. Fortunately, Elisa remained asymptomatic and resumed work after the two weeks off, but the, ultimately she was granted the Worker Relief Act payment and that helped her um, pay back rent and utilities that she was unable to pay during her income loss period. So the Worker Relief Fund, I think, is a really novel example of countering the overarching climate of political exclusion of immigrants and taking a stand to include folks that were carved out of state UI benefits and first um, edition of CARES Act benefits. Um, so I'm sort of out of time, but I just will mention that I moved this work forward um, in my partnership with the Lane County Public Health Department. I took a full leave of absence um, from the University of Oregon from the spring of 2022 um, till this fall. I'm now back full time as a faculty member. And during this period of time, I helped do some community assessments to launch the new community partnerships program. And one thing I did was an organizational assessment of all the CBOs that had partnered during COVID at these kinds of testing and immunization events. 
to ask them what their experience was partnering with local public health. Um, kind of the good, the bad, and the ugly. The idea was to use lessons learned to build best practices for local public health partnerships with CDOs moving forward beyond the pandemic. So the one thing I'll say about this experience, doing this community needs assessment, I did qualitative interviews um, online with staff and directors at about nine or 10 CDOs. This was, this, this was done in September of 2022 is it was quite cathartic, I think, for both myself. Um, I didn't always tell this to my interviewees, but also to the CDO folks to sit down for an hour and a half and just talk about their experience um, because we were now sort of moving beyond the pandemic tentatively, but thinking about the lessons that we had learned. And this word cloud on the slide just shows some of the key themes that came up from my content analysis of the interviews. And as I said, I won't go into this too much, but some of what this shows us is just the importance of local public health partnering with CBOs and using CBOs knowledge of an expert trusted relationships with communities moving beyond the pandemic because public health had to shift pivot uh, pivot very abruptly from those mass testing events to community centered events but hopefully some of those lessons in community partnership are institutionalized moving forward so in the next public health emergency and for other non-emergency reasons those partnerships persist and the CBO staff and directors that I talked to very much want that going forward. But the other thing I'll kind of end on here is that CBO staff also want local public health to take the lead, particularly in championing issues at the policy or structural level. So people talked about framing health issues in terms of social drivers of health, in terms of the policies that frame downstream health inequities. And in our community, probably like yours, Right now, houselessness is on everyone's mind. So a lot of people were talking about the importance of public health leading on framing houselessness, not as a problem of hygiene or environmental health, which is unfortunately, or like disease spread, which is unfortunately often how it's talked about, but more in line with the kinds of things that were talked about here at OPHA meetings a couple of weeks ago, you know, investments in affordable housing and eviction defense and keeping people sheltered. So there is a role for CBOs, but there's also a role for public health. And I had some other slides, but I think that's enough talking. So I'm happy to have some conversation with you all now. And I just want to thank you um, for allowing me to be here today. Also some of my students who helped me do this work, my colleagues at Lane County Public Health and um, folks at Innovation Law Lab. This is me and Carolina sometime in the winter of 2021. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Also, we want to take sure we are board. Repeat the repeat the question. Okay, so for folks online, we're um, currently in the webinar format. So if you have a question, there won't be a chat box, but there'll be a Q and A section, and you can submit um, your questions there. And we have someone monitoring that section, so we can read your question out loud. Um, thank you. That was super interesting, um, and I especially admire the tenacity of getting out right away and doing that kind of timely work during that time. Mm -hmm. I feel like I felt like I crawled under my own desk for a while and I just I you just got right of, out there. <laughs> I did a lot of that. <laughs> okay. Um so are there any questions for Kristen? Um so thank you very much. Um I was not surprised to hear that um you there was one event that you chose to shut down based on intimidation but i'm just curious if you have like a general idea of how many events were shut down um at that time because of some of the intimidation intimidation that was occurring sure yeah um so megan's asking about how many of the events um that were scheduled were shut down because of intimidation or other kind of political interference yeah, unfortunately, I don't have like the data on that. And I don't even know if Lane County or other local health departments kept that like systematically. I'd be interested to know that. I know anecdotally that they were numerous and it ramped up in 2021 when we were doing vaccination events. And it was so unfortunate, particularly because well, at that time, local health departments, including Lane County, were now, you know, having this really solid active relationships with CDO partners. So we'd done all these testing events with them and now we're doing vaccination events. And they were often really like happy events. Like there were activities for kids and 
we had great partners in our community who are advocates for the disability community who had like sensory friendly tents and a lot of work went into setting these up at local sites in the community and it was um, really a shame. I remember one that was set up by the Arc of Lane County, our disability rights group um, that provides a lot of social service organizations. And we had this event out in the, uh, Springfield and yeah, it had to get shut down. And it was just, um, it was always unfortunate um, and it cast a shadow. And then I'm imagining, you know, community members wondering, do I show up the next time? Is it safe to show up? But thank you for the question. I don't know if they collected systematic data on that. I know that OHA had events too throughout the state that were targeted, but I don't know if OHA kept data on that. Do you know? I don't. I remember hearing at one of the events here, at, recently used our stadium too, yeah. um, for one of the mass events. And I do remember it was a youth specific day mm -hmm. um, where things had kind of ramped up. I didn't see it, mm -hmm. um, but anyway, thank you for sharing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thanks. And the other thing I'll say that is coming to mind in this um, back and forth is that in the CBO assessment, one of the people I interviewed was from that disability rights organization, and she reflected on that experience. And one of the things she said is how important it is for local public health to, you know, not anticipate with fear that that could happen, but she felt like that could have been anticipated by that time. I mean, she thinks she was thinking about May 2021. And she just thought it's so how important it is, especially in politicized environments, when you're setting up these community events to take safety first. And I really remember her emphasizing that in that interview. And I took that back, of course, to public health. I mean, one of my concerns is all these experiences were so impactful for folks. Um, I'm glad that I wrote a report based on that community assessment. I know some people at public health have read it, but I'm worried that it'll get you know filed away and then in two years or whenever many years we have another emergency, like some of these lessons will be forgotten. You know, the hope is that people that lived through this will still be around and maybe remember. But like, I think that's something that's easy to forget how politicized these events unfortunately came and that we should have kind of known better. Um, yeah. Thank you. I don't know why it didn't occur to me before that I could just bring people along <laughs> anyway, instead of repeating your question. Thank you. I'm wondering, in your work with CBOs, did you hear folks talk about partnerships with health systems or with CCOs as sources of sustained funding and difficulties in, in those kinds of partnerships? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. So the, the thinking about, you know, collaborating with CCOs, um, coordinated care organizations. I didn't ask that in the assessment. It was particularly focused on partnering with local public health. But I do know that in some parts of the county, particularly for us in Lane County, we have a large, as I briefly mentioned in this talk, a large community, hundreds large, maybe thousands large, of mom-speaking folks from Guatemala in the Cottage Grove area. And in that community, there is a pretty strong collaborative relationship for healthcare access with the local um, I think it's Pete's Health. I forget the organization that's there, the HMO, the health provider. Um, and they have a network of relationships with CBOs and they do things like dental clinics and other kinds of reproductive health clinics in the community and a lot of public education in the community. I've actually had graduate students do some work um, down there in that community for health providers around issues of structural and cultural competency. But my interviews didn't really focus on that explicitly. Of course, that's a whole other piece of the puzzle. I don't know if you all, if you're asking because you're involved here in like your chip chaw process, but that's a huge thing in Lane County Public Health is the community health assessment or community health improvement plan. And that's all done in collaboration with CCOs. We have two main CCOs in Lane County. Um, I don't know who's on the webinar, so maybe I'll talk to you after. I mean, I think it's an open question, the extent to which CCOs are really connected to the community, right? Like they're serving a slice of the community and they tend to be people who have private insurance. Um, sometimes um, they do serve a more emergency or primary health care function, but I would say in Lane County, our county health clinics, our county health centers, our CHCs across the county, particularly for rural folks, are much more that front line of primary health care um, for people like out in Florence or at the coast or rural parts of the county. Um, had another thought about that. Oh, I don't know if news has made it up here, but the 
one of our two health providers in Eugene just closed. Did that news get up here? So the Eugene, the only Eugene admitting emergency room is closing. Um, yeah, so we have real gaps in emergency room and crisis care now, and that's like a whole other topic. So certainly there's need to collaborate with CCOs, especially around the provision of like primary health care and emergency health care, but it wasn't a part of my work. online and on that course. We have an online James James Robbins. I appreciate the shift to community-based testing events and your work to gather data on the concerns of Latinx, community members for testing. I'm curious if you were able to inquire about the perspectives of CVOs or community members on what equ equitable testing and disease mitigation would look like to them. Also, did you run into any issues of language access during your work? Thank you for sharing your work. It's like, ask Mike. We should put the uh, second one in the budget. Yeah. <laughs> it's fun to ask Mike. Thank you, um, James. That's a great question. Yes, um, I think that I appreciate the opportunity to elaborate more on like what a community friendly event would look like. And I'll just do that like more descriptively. Some of our most successful community events were actually at schools. And I think, as I mentioned a little bit in the presentation, like um, what it's really about is finding folks in different communities who are the trusted, you know, um, centers of community information, right? So Kenny knows this so well. <laughs> so like it's diff diffusing information through people who are trusted, trusted leaders, whether those folks work formally in the health sector or not. And often for immigrant communities, like their main interaction, if you will, with like government is through public schools or Head Start, and they trust their kids' teachers. So some of our best events were at schools, and I think it's because the school staff set the event up, they invited public health to come in, and then they used all of their school messaging channels to get parents out. And by the way, when we would do these events, although we had special outreach for Spanish language members of the community, all school parents were welcome. So we had a really diverse set of parents showing up, and I think what that looked like for people was there were tables of information. Like I said, there were like arts and crafts for kids. Eventually, we got up to date with more sensory friendly approaches. And we had like a tent where a parent could go in with their kid. And there was like a blanket and pillows and bean bags. And they could take all the time they needed with the nurse to get their shot when we were doing immunizations or their test. So I think it was just about slowing the process down. And then also, you know, having the food there. Having the, you know, person making the squeaky balloons for the kids, like a lot of kid-friendly things. Food boxes were always a big hit because food insecurity was pretty rampant. And then information, we usually had tables from social service providers on available services. And eventually, Lane County also was able to provide rent support and eviction prevention assistance to people. So they were, they were there with their table asking folks if they needed help. So it became this whole event where we were you know, think of 2020, like we were just saying, most of us were shut in. So it was like the space to show up and like, what's going on in the community and where can I get the help that I need? So to be really honest, I don't want to go back to 2020, but I miss that. Like the zeitgeist of that moment got really addicting to me because otherwise I was just teaching on remote and I was like overwhelmed with my classes, like probably many of you were on Zoom and all the things, but I would show up to these community events and it just it, you know, you felt the Weberian sense of collective efficacy. I'll just say that for any sociologist in the room. It felt like this is what community looks like. And public health would just like a small part of that. So the other thing about language, I guess I would just say is that, yes, we had, um, it was so important that Lane County Public Health, and I would venture to say many local health departments already when COVID hit, had bilingual, bicultural staff, you know, the importance of diversifying our public health workforce is primordial for just this reason, right? Because you can't just like wait till the pandemic hits to hire people who speak Spanish and know the community. So that was really important. Like they had folks already on staff, but then they realized we didn't have mom speakers on staff and mom indigenous language speakers are a big part of our Latinx or immigrant community. So that required partnering with local organizations. There's one social service organization in Cottage Grove that really has trust with that community. And they knew who could translate from Spanish to mom. So they got those folks out at the event. So every time we were in South Lane County, we had mom translation, um, which was really important. 
And I won't go into this too much, but the mom language is a non-literate language. So the other big piece of that was in health prevention messaging that the county did and that CBOs did and continues to be a big issue is just like infographics, visual information, because it's um, a, a non-written language. Hopefully I answered that. I, do we have time for one? Yeah. Okay. So, so Neil's and patient yes. reading, so right. <laughs> da, da, da. Thank you, Kristen, for a great presentation. I was wondering if you have or you plan to share the results of your CBO assessment with the Lane County Health Department, and if so, what reaction you expect from that? You're getting your stuff. Thank you so much. So Neil, thank you for that question. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit more about this. So to be clear, when I did this CBO assessment, I'm actually employed for Lane County Public Health. So from 2022 um, spring through just right now, I was a part-time employee. So they paid me to do it. So definitely I shared it with them. <laughs> and the Community Partnerships Program at Lane County Public Health came out of public health modernization. Um, one of the key principles there is you know, community engagement, cultural diversity, and accessibility. Um, but I think the idea was an organizational assessment precisely to capture kind of the moment of what we learned as a local health authority in that moment of collaboration during pandemic response and to kind of carry it forward. By, so we have a, a nice report and it's glossy. It's on the official letterhead. But quite honestly, I think your question points to the importance of like presenting that again to leadership. I know they saw it like right after it was completed, but um, I think it's important to kind of keep going back to that or maybe doing multiple iterations of these kinds of assessments of community partners, particularly as OHA and local health departments now are really focused on CDOs. There's a lot of funding in that direction. And there are, as many of us are experts on, you know, there are strengths and limitations to partnering with CDOs. And that was one of the things I tried to mention here. Like CBOs want local health departments to collaborate with them and they want local health staff to respect the relationships they have with community and their knowledge of community, but they admit they're not experts in public health. So it was also very frustrating and uneven for CBOs to be like told by Lane County or OHA in 2020, create messaging on the importance of masking. And they were like, well, where do we get this? Like, we're not public health experts. So you need to give us the message then we can kind of tailor it or something like that. So they're still saying, you know, there's a role for public health, particularly on these policy issues. That was what I heard loud and clear. Um, like they're seeing the problems downstream and they want local health departments to be advocating for policies to address health inequities at the state and quite honestly, the federal level. Because they're like, we don't have anyone on staff that can do that. We don't have the time for that. We're just trying to plug the holes and meet the needs in our community. So I hope that responds. Thank you. We're all thank you. I think okay. um, we are we are at and over time. My apologies for my apologies. Thank you. Uh, let's thank Kristen again.